virtually all spiritual traditions affirm the possibility of some measure of inner peace or tranquility. So here are a few readings from several of these traditions. First from the Chinese poet Po Chui, ninth century China. I've lived through 65 years now, my temples halfway grizzled into gray. Each year more abandoned still to the inevitable unfolding of things. Anywhere tranquil is my old home now, and I think my thatch hut may be ready next spring up on the mountain. From Rumi, the Sufi Islamic tradition, you are a traveler and in a ship. You are under the protection of a life-giving spirit. You are at ease and asleep in the ship. You are going on the way. From the Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh, the present moment is filled with joy and happiness. If you are attentive, you will see it. <laughs> Excerpts from the 23rd Psalm from the Hebrew Scriptures. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. There is a table prepared for me in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows. From St. Paul in the Christian New Testament. I have learned in whatever state I am, therewith to be content. <laughs> and finally, from our own nature poet, Mary Oliver, a few lines that will provide the text for the talk that follows. It is time now, I said, for the deepening and quieting of the spirit among the flux of happenings. It is time now, I said, for the deepening and quieting of the spirit among the flux of happenings. About tomorrow, who knows anything except that it will be time again for the deepening and quieting of the spirit. Now, these lines from various traditions give expression to our intense yearning for a measure of tranquility, of comfort, of vitality in our inner lives, amid the flux of happenings in the outer world. That flux of happenings, of course, is enormous. It includes the difficulties of everyday life, always and everywhere, negotiating the relationships of family, work and social life, physical infirmities, illness, and the approach of death, the inevitable experience of disappointment and loss. This flux of happening also, also includes the constant busyness, distractions, and, in, and unwelcome intrusions of modern life, interacting with medical or financial bureaucracies, enduring the endless assaults of advertising, solicitation, spam, or robocalls, and it certainly includes the perilous state of our political life, wars and rumors of wars in many places, a growing environmental crisis, and the persistent threat of nuclear holocaust. No wonder we may feel like a motherless child. No wonder we may yearn for a deepening and quieting of the spirit. At least on occasion and sometimes more often, we may feel quite remote from anything approaching a deepening and quieting of the spirit. And we may feel ourselves to be personal spiritual failures. Now, clearly the circumstances of our personal lives and of the larger world have an impact on our ability to experience the deepening and quieting of the spirit. We will have to live with this inextricable mixture of joys and sorrows, pleasure and pain, good health and illness, exaltation and depression, tranquility and distress, the light and the dark. We are not likely to arrive at any permanent state of bliss, tranquility, or enlightenment. 
This is life in a difficult and imperfect world. It is not personal failure. This is life in a difficult and, imper and imperfect world. It is not personal failure. But we are not entirely at the mercy of external circumstances or internal distress. We have a measure of freedom to choose. Precisely how much is a matter of endless debate, and of course it varies with our circumstances. But all religious and spiritual paths assume some ability to act, to decide, to make choices, to deliberately cultivate our inner lives. Speaking on behalf of God, Moses told his wayward people, I have set before you this day life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life that you and your descendants may live. So what does it mean to choose life? Certainly it does not imply that we can conjure up a quietness of the spirit at will. But within limits, we have some freedom, some capacity to choose where to direct our attention. If the news is overwhelming, we can choose to limit our access to it. If we are caught up in reactivity, in old stories, in habitual responses, we can at the very least pause, take a couple of deep breaths and consider a wiser response. All meditation practice is based on this capacity to choose. If you have tried meditation, you know that your mind has a mind of its own. <laughs> but you, you can deliberately return again and again to an awareness of your breath or to whatever the focus of your meditation might be. In the context of daily life, we can choose to expose ourselves to the sense of mystery and wonder that so frequently intrudes on our ordinary lives. The appreciation of a redwood tree, a wild flower, the night sky, the surf. All of this conveys a sense of mystery. It is the poets who best evoke it. Listen to the 12th century Chinese poet Yang Wan Li. The ox path I'm on ends in a rabbit trail. And suddenly I'm facing open plains and empty sky on all four sides. My thoughts follow a pair of white egrets taking flight, leading my sight across a million blue mountains, rising ridge beyond ridge. Even a single hill or valley means thoughts beyond knowing. And all this, a crusty old man is now a wide-eyed child. A crusty old man is now a wide-eyed child. Among the greatest of these mysteries is that of love. The Sufi poet Rumi wrote, love is the way messengers from mystery tell us things. The New Testament puts it very simply. God is love. So, love of children, partners, friends, and yourself, love of our cats and dogs, love of the earth, love of your work, these and a thousand other expressions of love given or received, when you experience any of these, you are in the presence of mystery. We can also practice what we might call deliberate noticing. The American exemplar of this practice was Henry David Thoreau, who strongly advocated what he called sauntering, or taking long walks. In fact, he confessed that he did not understand how anybody could maintain their sanity unless they sauntered at least four hours a day. His sauntering practice began with careful observation, noticing what happened while he walked, noticing what he witnessed when he was in the woods. And accompanying this noticing was a sense of wonder and gratitude. He speaks of a sunset enveloped in mystery and poetry. <clears throat> and are we not all moved to a sense of wonder and mystery when we are confronted with the beauty, the complexity, the interdependence, the sheer elemental and majestic presence of the world we inhabit? And connected to wonder is gratitude. We are permitted, albeit briefly, 
to witness, to enjoy, to know something of this boundless and mysterious creation that we inhabit. Is that not enough cause for thanksgiving? For Thoreau, and for us, surely, this kind of deliberate noticing can contribute to the deepening and quieting of the spirit. There is a comfort in recognizing that we are, as Thoreau put it, part and parcel of nature, not only members of society. This is very much the sensibility of Thomas Merton, the Trappist monk, poet, and social activist who wrote from his cabins in the woods, I think it was in Kentucky somewhere. Here he writes, I am not alien. The trees I know, the night I know, the rain I know. I close my eyes and instantly sink into the whole rainy world of which I am a part, and the world goes on with me in it, for I am not alien to it. So, we can be at home as an integral part of the cosmos and of this tiny planet with its intricate web of life. In doing so, we can find some measure of deepening and quieting of the spirit. Another benefit to Thoreau's kind of sauntering lies in the perspective it offers on all the works of humankind. Listen to Thoreau commenting on his walking tours around Concord, Massachusetts. From many a hill, I can see civilization and the abodes of man from afar. Man and his affairs, church and state and school, trade and commerce, even politics, the most alarming of them all. I am pleased to see how little space they occupy in the landscape. Politics is but a narrow field. It is as the cigar smoke of a man. Perhaps a useful reminder as we approach the election. Thoreau's kind of deliberate noticing does not deny or repress our very real difficulties. It simply reminds us that alongside those difficulties lies so much else. Deliberate noticing can also awaken us to the extraordinary quality of ordinary life. This is the message, the central message of Thornton Wilder's classic American play, Our Town. At the end of the play, a young woman named Emily, recently dead, gets a chance to return for a single day to the land of her living. And when she does, she observes with astonishment the richness and significance of the utterly ordinary. And in that amazement, she cries out, clocks ticking and mama's sunflowers and food and coffee and newly ironed dresses and hot baths and sleeping and waking up. Oh, earth, you're too wonderful for anybody to realize you. Do any human beings ever realize life while they live it? Beyond deliberate noticing of what is all around us, we can also work directly with what is within us. We can nurture the states of mind that are associated with a quieting of the spirit. The Buddhists have identified four such states of mind that we can quite deliberately and intentionally cultivate. They call them the four immeasurables or the four divine abodes. The first is loving kindness, a feeling of warmth, appreciation, goodwill, and friendliness. Second, there is compassion or an empathetic response to the suffering of others and a desire to alleviate that suffering. A third is appreciative joy, unselfish pleasure in the success or well-being of others and of ourselves. And finally, there is equanimity, an even-minded, balanced calmness and acceptance of the changing conditions of life. Now, we all have the capacity to experience these qualities, and we often do so in the course of our ordinary living. But the Buddhists tell us, at least, that these qualities can be deliberately cultivated or invoked, perhaps as a part of meditation practice or as a part of the way we behave in the world. 
None of this is a permanent once and for all arrival at a place of deepening and quieting of the spirit. It is rather the repetitive task of a lifetime. As Mary Oliver reminds us, about tomorrow, who knows anything except that it will be time again for the deepening and quieting of the spirit. Now, in pursuing this deepening and quieting of the spirit in these ways, we are entering the realm of what we might call everyday mysticism. Most of us would probably be reluctant to identify ourselves as mystic. It seems like claiming too much. Unitarians in particular have inherited a strong streak of religious rationalism that perhaps precludes much in the way of mysticism. And yet, have we not all been, have we not all experienced something of mystery, wonder, love, and beauty? Have we not been moved by a conversation with a friend, the birth of a child, the death of a beloved person, by a poem or a piece of music? When my wife and I lie on the couch with our little black cat, there is something mystical in our communion with her. In these and a thousand other ways, we are all mystics, even Unitarians. <laughs> this capacity for everyday mysticism, for a kind of knowing that words can hardly express, even if it is momentary and intermittent, this kind of everyday mysticism is a great gift of human consciousness. It will not permanently resolve the difficulties of your life or permanently calm your distressed soul. But the practice of everyday mysticism provides the comfort of connection with that which is greater than ourselves. It suggests that the flux of happenings which so often threatens to overwhelm us is not the only reality. Everyday mysticism grants us perhaps glimpses of eternity and it pierces the veil between this world and what lies beyond, beneath, or within. It is time now, I said, for the deepening and quieting of the spirit. Amid the flux of happenings, about tomorrow, who knows anything, except that it will be time again and again and again for the deepening and the quieting of the Spirit. Amen.